How's that? Perfect. Yeah, I'm, I'm switching off my microphone, my mute mic microphone. <laughs> OK, I guess the only thing is, is if anybody types any questions because I'm in my presentation screen, they probably won't ping off, will they? Oh, maybe they will actually. We, we probably can deal with every... At the end. At the end, I think that, that would be better. Okay. All right, then, in that case, I'll make a start. So, um, so this, good morning to everybody who is out there. Um, so we're restarting Heart Talks, where, where we left off um, in the structure of the curriculum was that we were doing pulmonary trees of VSD mappers. Um, and some of you might recall that the last lecture I think that we had, or one of the most recent, was Ange, and he covered um, a little bit of the literature. So we're going to do a journal club today on a paper, one of the papers that he cited actually, which is one of the big papers in pulmonary trees of ESD mapkers that we still use today. Um, so just a reminder, pulmonary trees of ESD mapkers can be thought of as an extreme variant of fallow. It falls into the chromotrunkal abnormality um, kind of spectrum. Um, and what is the most important consideration in these children? And I think particularly when you're managing them is what is the source of pulmonary blood flow? And that tends to be what dictates their current and future management. Um, i.e. single stage, multi-stage. So just a quick diagram, because I'm not sure who's out there and, and what they've covered before, um, but that's just a diagrammatic representation of the fact that your right ventricle outflow is, I mean, this is extremely weedy, hopefully it's not that bad, but obviously it's pulmonary atresia, you'd hope for something more and some bigger PAs, but quite possibly not the case. And sometimes, um, obviously this is demonstrating MAPCAs here, um, and sometimes it's very difficult to see any intrapericardial pulmonary arteries at all, but that is one of the rare and more extreme variants. So there's lots of literature out there about pulmonary atresia BSD. Um, and I think when I was looking at it, everybody's just trying to get together a reasonably big cohort of experience from their centre and share it with everybody else. Um, most of what I read was kind of along the same line, but there's the odd paper out there which takes a slightly different management strategy, um, but we'll come back to that towards the end of the presentation. So when we look at evidence, obviously evidence is what we use to guide our practice. Without good evidence, um, we, or if we're using poor evidence to, to conduct our practice, then obviously and it's flawed, then that's not great for the patients. And obviously in paediatric cardiology, it's particularly challenging because there's ethical issues. Some of the best kinds of evidence are randomised controlled trials, but at the end of the day, there's serious ethical issues with doing that in children, particularly in such children who require surgical management and interventional management. And so a lot of our evidence on this is other centres, their experience, their numbers, and their kind of shared point of view. So the paper that I decided to look at, which hopefully Oleg emailed out a copy of, um, and I can send anybody who hasn't, um, was one centre with an experience over 15 years and 458 patients, which is pretty good sample size. Um, they were looking at fallow with pulmonary atresia. They also mentioned that they were looking at severe PS. They didn't really expand on that. Um, it wasn't clear. Um, and the diagnosis they used involved echo, CT and angio. Um, the centre you we looked at has got a fairly standardised approach about how they manage their patients. They um, they kind of put them into a into a flow chart, if you will. Um, so they say that 167 of those patients, of those 458, were initially repaired elsewhere, i.e. another centre. And so the surgical strategy may have been slightly different, and it's important to note that. And their, um, their system is to try and unifocalise the MAPCAs into a single system of pulmonary blood flow. They're, when they refer to complete repair, they're referring to unifocalization, VSD closure, and placement of a conduit. And when they refer to single stage, they mean they're doing all that in a single procedure. Bernie, your presentation is not in presenter mode, so you can't actually see the slides as you're going through. Oh. Can you 
Oh, press the presentation. how do I do that then? Yeah, it's just, yeah. Oh, how do I do that? Presenter mode. Let's have a look. I'm really sorry. Um, bear with me, I think Rob's on the way to the rescue. <laughs> He's going to rescue me. Um, yes, uh, press uh, the button. Uh, stop uh, sharing right the near the, uh, Okay, go back to PowerPoint. Yeah. Get PowerPoint running. Yeah. And go back to Teams. Yeah. And now share it. And pick PowerPoint as your sharing screen. That That's one. what I did. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. You can see it now. Yeah. Okay. So. One centre, 458 patients, good sample size, um, and it's just important to note that when they talk about complete repair and single stage repair, that's what they're referring to. Can everybody see that slide? Yes. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, so this is the kind of flow chart that they use when they assess their patients and they send them off down their treatment pathway. So they make a diagnosis and they refer to dual supply, yes or no. And they, about 50 of their patients ended up in this sample, ended up with AP windows, and then at four to seven months when they were bigger, went for a more definitive repair, which um, tended to be unifocalization, closure of VSD. Um, when we get further down this flow chart, you can see that they're aiming for the majority of the patients, what they want, is complete repair, ideally single stage. Um, obviously, that's not suitable for all patients. And then they have a group of patients in which they put in a central shunt. Um, and then it's often these patients with the more complex anatomy, with the more suboptimal substrate, more complex supply of pulmonary blood flow that end up with numerous revisions. Um, we'll touch on this more later and you'll see with the data how this reflects what they were doing. Um, so the way I decided to approach this was more of a critical appraisal um, sort of tool. So when we're reading a paper, we want to know if the results are valid, what they are, and if they'll actually help us in our practice, in our centre. So the first thing you touch on is, did they, did they address a clearly focused issue? And you're looking at the population, what it is that they were looking at, um, whether they consider their outcomes it's I guess it's all part of if you're going to take the time to collect all of this data have you got a clearly focused question um, which is the starting point for all research now this was a single center experience over 15 years with a pretty good sample size um, they've looked at their pop their, their population is obviously upon diagnosis their population is appropriate um, they've um, chosen clear outcomes in the sense they've looked at mortality, ICU stay, hospital stay, um, how many of them achieved um, unifocalization, single stage. Um, they've looked at um, RV pressure to, they looked at RV systemic pressure as a, as a measure of outcome. Um, and they included those that weren't primarily, primarily repaired at their institute. So they didn't necessarily follow the algorithm that they've set out for their patients. But as you'll see later, they do a separate analysis on those patients, which I think is fairly prudent. Um, so the way that they selected their cohort, so this is, a, this is less relevant because this is a retrospective review of their practice. So obviously when they select their cohort, they want to know what they're looking at. So they've obviously excluded the diagnosis that they're not interested in, but otherwise it's not like they're prospectively selecting their patients. Um, and I guess the questions are, did they include everybody they should have done? The people that they did include, did they make it clear why they didn't include them? Um, so the population was quite appropriate. But my only question was, was that they'd mentioned the inclusion of severe pulmonary stenosis, i.e. severe end of fallow. And it wasn't clear whether these patients had some anti-grade flow across their RVOT and whether that would have made, I suppose, made any difference in the outcome in these patients and whether they should have been included or not. But I'm not clear on that. And that was more just a question I had when I was reading the paper. Um, the next question you ask is, is it worth carrying on? Because if you get that far 
into a study and a lot of the answers that you've come out with are quite negative then sometimes you might just stop reading that that piece of um, piece of work because obviously there's a lot of literature out there we probably all get several journals in the post every week and it's hard to find the time to read them so we want to be reading quality evidence so when they talk about exposure obviously this isn't a random randomized controlled trial this isn't exposure as in one was given to medicine another was given a placebo um but um i suppose you could interpret exposure as this group had this kind of repair strategy this group had this kind of repair strategy but that was more that they were following their own algorithm and then looking at the outcomes um so when we also look at bias so i just wanted to touch on that in case because obviously there's a lot in statistics and research that isn't always clear so with bias you're looking at any process that interferes um with the with the results and is and differs from the truth and there's different types of bias um which is important to know um as i said there's not an exposure as such um and they didn't randomize them to anything they just followed their algorithm as this is a retrospective type study um with a kind of observational type format and they're using their own algorithm so it's not so much an issue so did they use subjective or objective measurements did they measure what they should have done so they were looking at pretty clear outcomes they were looking at mortality icu length of stay they were looking at rv to a auto pressure ratio which is an interesting one that i have only just come across when reading this paper and then rv systolic pressure measurements um we talk about confounding factors so confounding factors are an outside influence that changes the effect of a variable and a variable being variable being something that is a random phenomenon so for example a variable may have been that the primary treating center wasn't then in 167 of the patients however they did a separate analysis on those patients i.e their own group of patients that were repaired primarily with them and the ones that were done elsewhere and they found no statistical significant difference in survival or outcomes I guess you could also consider genetic diagnoses, which a fair number of these children has, as you see in chronotronchal abnormalities. And that would be an independent variable, something that we have no control over, but does need to be accounted for. And in their findings, as we come to the results, they did see that they, these children had poorer outcomes. And that is important for us when we're preparing these children for surgery and we're counseling these parents. So the follow up needs to be adequate, it needs to be long enough, it needs to be as complete as possible so the quality of your data is the best that it can be. They say they managed a mean follow-up of four and a half, nearly four and a half years, which is pretty good, but they didn't say a huge amount in their methods. They said 173 managed to achieve five years of follow-up, but they don't actually tell us if they lost any to follow up and i suspect they probably did or perhaps they didn't and they're an excellent center i don't know um there was some mention about the children that they looked at coming from other centers having incomplete data um but not much expansion on that um so just go back one so results so you want to look at the bottom line results you want it to be clear um have they proven statistical significance? What have they looked at? And it's all coming back to the quality of the evidence. Um, that's a little bit small, I do apologize. Um, but essentially what they're doing there is they're separating all of the patients in the cohort, and then they're looking at the patients that were only primarily repaired and managed at their center. And this is where they're showing us they've separately looked at those 167 patients that came from elsewhere and didn't follow their own algorithm. Um, they're not, and they're not so much touching on outcomes here, but more the kind of treatment path that they took, um, and they've made it as clear as they possibly can. This is all the things that they looked at. So, sorry, that's a touch small, but what essentially they were looking at whether these children had genetic diagnoses, whether their first surgery was done with them or elsewhere, and what that surgery was. Early outcomes such as death, duration of ICU and hospital stay, um, then follow up, um, and whether they were alive um, during at the end of follow up, um, if they died, 
early, late. They looked at a lot of outcomes. Um, now, this is a Kaplan-Meier curve, which we'll come back to, but essentially what they're doing there is they're looking at the probability, Kaplan-Meier curve is looking at the probability of an event happening. And in these, the way that we use them is we look at the prob probability of the patient being alive at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years after the intervention. So you can see that on the top screen, the top section there, they've particularly looked at chromosomal abnormality. And you can see that the probability that the patient is alive at 10 years is lower in children who have a genetic diagnosis. And they've particularly mentioned 22Q and, and they put allergy or other into a separate category because they didn't have very many of those. Um, they then looked at those that had their um, complete repair versus another type of surgery at their centre in particular. And then they've looked at um, complete repair versus other palliative procedures in the whole population in the bottom um, square. And I think what's helpful is that they've got some nice tables that highlight the things that they felt were the most um, important to highlight. So they've looked, they've, so we're looking at statistical significance there, p-value less than 0 0.05, which we'll come back to. So that's saying chromosomal abnormality, particularly 22q, was statistically significant, but RV to aorta pressure was statistically significant. And they interestingly the number of MAPCAs that they unifocalized. Um, so the results were fairly clear. There's a lot of them because they looked at a lot of outcomes. Um, what they've said is, is out of the 458 patients, 402 of them eventually had complete repairs, 186 of those being single stage, um, and 74 having had some palliative procedure prior. Um, seven deaths were associated. Um, and they've looked at the number of MAPCAs, chromosomal abnormality and higher RV to aorta pressure, ra pressure ratios as being a statistically significant predictor of outcome. Um, again, allergial, so they put them in the kind of allergial and other category, but they acknowledged that there was only 13 patients out of the 458, but that they, it was clear that they had an increased mortality. But again, you're working with small numbers out of the bigger sample. Um, and again, they did a separate breakdown of their own centre versus those primarily repaired at another centre, and they found no major difference in survival. So when we're looking at results, it's important that we look at how confident we are that the result that we've produced is correct. And obviously, it depends on data. Um, you get out what you put in. Um, now, when we look at this statement, which says survival was significantly better among patients whose first surgery was complete repair. And then there's all these numbers afterwards, which I always find a little bit difficult to interpret. But the things that jump out for me are confidence interval and p-value. So confidence intervals say that there's a range of possible values. And when they describe a confidence interval of 95%, what they're saying is that you can be 95% sure that the true value lies in that interval that you have stated. As I said, the Kaplan-Meier curve, is you, we use it to look at survival. But what it's doing is it's predicting the probability that the patient will still be alive at X number of years. And then coming to p-values, so if a p-value is less than 0.05, what we're saying is we're rejecting the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is that there is no statistical significant difference in what we're looking at. What we're saying is, is that it's happened purely because of chance, that it's not a clear um, kind of cause and outcome. Um, and I think it's important to kind of look at those things and have a little think about them because it's fairly easy to read an article and just blaze through it and not actually understand. I know I struggle with the confidence intervals, the p-values, the Kaplan-Meier curves, and you really want to be looking at the quality of data that's being produced. So that's just looking at confidence with confidence intervals um, with your 95% sure it lies in this um, range with only 2.5% either side lying outside of that. The next question I guess you need to ask yourself is, do you believe the results? Um, 
and in this study it was a pretty good sample size with a pretty good length of follow-up um, a lot of what we do in pediatric cardiology as i said is is we, we retrospectively review a large center retrospectively reviews its own practice and shares it um, with others um, this is we learn from one another um, as i said bias is not so much an issue the patient weren't patients weren't randomized as such um, and the methods do appear sufficient though there's not much about follow-up and those that were lost to follow up and that was my only question really with this one so then you start to look at whether you can apply the results to your own population because i guess that's one of the most important things when you're looking at such evidence um, are those in their cohort significantly different to our own or have we a similar population what's our local setting like what are our resources like so it's mainly a resource consideration in the setup of our services. Um, there was one thing that came up that I wasn't quite sure about, which was they were talking about the use of bypass to increase flow to the pulmonary circulation whilst measuring pressure in order to determine vascular, pulmonary vascular resistance and then thereby clarifying that yes it's fine we're safe to close the vsd without need worrying about leaving a fenestration that needs to be dealt with later or ever ending up in a situation where we're doing a vsd takedown and it's probably my ignorance and the fact that i haven't been to theater enough because i don't know whether this is something that we do um, so it's just something that i noted and i wondered whether it's something we did here um, so do the results of this study fit with the other evidence that's out there and i guess for me one of the main things was and i think Ange touched on this talk is that there are other centers out there with a different experience um, they describe that unifocalization this is an Australian this is Royal Melbourne and they're saying that for them unifocalization isn't the only way to manage these children and that actually um, they feel that these mapkas do not grow very well even when you do unifocalize them the unifocalizing them isn't a benefit um, and I found that really interesting and actually if you look up that paper um, on that website there's a really interesting um, exchange between Frank Hanley and the writers of this paper and they just completely outright disagree with each other um, in, a, in a really polite way but they have two very different points of view and two very different approaches. Um, so these guys say that the absence of true central pulmonary arteries is not a risk factor and that outcomes are comparable and that MAPCAS shouldn't be written off. Um, and they say that specific characteristics of pulmonary artery anatomy may, may well ameliorate the risks in our population. And I think we all know that if we've got nice, good size, true intrapericardial um, intravenous um, pulmonary arteries, we're more likely to be able to do single stage, more straightforward. This study said they have better outcomes. And so I think it is fair to say that, that yes, if you have a more favourable population, more of them are going to have a single stage repair, more of them are going to have complete unifocalization. But they do mention that they're not in this piece of work they're not trying to evaluate one management strategy against another they're simply reviewing their own practice and sharing their experience but as i said there's there's emerging evidence that univocalization is not the only strategy out there and some particularly this australian group feel pretty strongly um uh that univocalization of mapkas is not of benefit and that they do not they do not grow well and that um, you have lots of issues with thrombosis and stenosis later down the line so what are the implications to our practice i mean this is just one of this is just one study and it's it's not you know you can't just immediately apply it to your own population um and i guess one of the things in this paper is they didn't touch much on re-intervention um which i think is a really important part of follow-up and i think those that have experience with children with pulmonary atresia VSD map because with particularly poor pulmonary arteries and multifocal blood supply will say that these children have lots and lots of re-interventions and that's a significant burden um, both for those families and children and for our service. 
So that's the end of the talk. These are all the references if you're interested. Um, the papers that I use, the Australian papers on there, I think, plus the paper that we've we've discussed today. Um, and also the critical appraisal tool that you can apply um, to pretty much any piece of, of evidence um, and ask those questions whether you feel that it's a good quality piece of evidence. So that is it. I will reopen teams um okay so bernie uh, uh, it was a, it was a, a, a terrific, a terrific uh, presentation. really thank you for thank you for um so i wanted if you could want, to, want to, to start asking questions to bernie and I switch off, I mute myself. Can I, can I ask a question? Can I? Yep. Hi. So, Bunny, very, very good um, review of that paper. As you rightly pointed out, as, as good as the, the paper says about uh, reintervention and survival, um, there is very little that's mentioned about the non-surgical reintervention because as much as we can, we try not to reintervene in most cases um, surgically if um, if we are able to. Is that right, Rafael um, and Atilio and Ram? No, actually, my, my view is the other way around. I mean, if you really want to rescue the patient's long term, you have to go for aggressive non-surgical intervention, catheter yes. intervention. And, yes, and, and early is very important. I mean, soon yeah. after repair, within six weeks, eight weeks, um, you have to go aggressively. Otherwise, you lose those vessels. Yes, that's that's yeah. right. So I think in this paper, they, they don't really the mention that much time. about it. Yeah. No, and I guess the no, and I guess the interesting thing is, it, and what I found really interesting is when you when you look at this paper. And then you look at the Australian paper and the Australian guys have a completely different point of view. And then you follow the conversation between Frank Hanley and the authors of the Australian paper. You can literally see they're like chalk and cheese. They have two completely different approaches and really very strong feelings about the management of these patients. And so, as Ram was saying, we go after these MAPCAs, we unifocalize them, we incorporate them. We, we want to save them before they start stenosing and, and regressing. Whereas the Australian guys are saying, those vessels were never really any good in the first place. They're not even convinced that, you know, they're not even calling them that because I think they call them bronchial arteries or something. And they're saying, you know, inevitably these vessels, it's their natural progression. They want to regress, they want to thrombose, and they really don't feel that unifocalizing them is the best way forward. And I guess they're saying if you unifocalize them, you're just going to end up reintervening on these children on numerous occasions, which is obviously one of the big issues that we have with the more complex children with the kind of mixed source of pulmonary blood flow. And I guess that's that's the bit that I found really interesting that some centres can be doing it so differently to other people, other centres and just have a, just a very different approach. Do you think, do you think the outcome um, just reflects the fact that the more Normal, the initial anatomy, the easier it is to fix. Yeah, yeah. I think that Rob, uh, that's what Bernie was touching in, in one of the slides, which is very important. That which is that um, I don't know how it's called, but it's um, that you, that you essentially you read really it well. Really well bias. Bias. They say the single stage, the single best. stage, best. Um, um, and not the stage, stage because, because the only reason like stage, stage is because the anatomy was stable. Um, so if I have a um, pulmonary test ABSD mapka with not too bad uh, a pulmonary mm -hmm. artery plus mapcas, I probably will go and close the mapcas, re full repair, etc. And of course, those patients will do best than the rest. But uh, I think they, what they were trying to associate and what this is the group from Stanford, I guess. And the Stanford group was trying to promote was that how uh, and to get all the patients from around the world is they will do single stage right from the beginning. So so people were sending them patients in. Uh, so because it's a different kind of healthcare, 
it would be much better for the parents go one operation all done rather than going 25 operation. But I think is the assumption, uh, which is have some terminology, and Bernie mentioned that is is incorrect because they say the only reason that the single stay is best is because you are choosing the right, the nice patients to be in that group. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think it, it's hard to imagine that for the spec, the end of the spectrum that's nearly like a normal fallow, it's hard to imagine that you wouldn't do it as near a normal fallow, but the spectrum where you've got virtually no quotes central normal pulmonary arteries is, is fundamentally surgically and anatomically kind of not really comparable with that. I mean, I think, I think you've got to, I don't know what the answer is, but I think you would have to separate. It looks like a spectrum, but actually you've got to become um, binary in how you group the patients. You've got to decide, no, you're going to be just a kind of dodgy fallow, or you're going to be a pulmonary atresia matcus, and you've got to go into some sort of plan around that strategy and and the, the the point about the australian group is a is a kind of interesting point you know i mean i think that's we we do recognize that these blood vessels do not behave at all well and i was um i think we we talked about about the last time about this and yes i think that it i think it is a very good idea because if if we um so if we do CT scans, MRIs in any tetralogy, in many of them, there will be tetralogy with moderate PA, and in some of them, we'll find some kind of map cast they find yeah. by CT scan MRI. And if we put them all into this in our study, uh, I think that we will dilute the number of cases and we'll yeah. say our outcomes are great. <clears throat> but you have 40 or 50% of extreme tetralogy with a bit of map cast. They, because yeah. they, this map cast you will include in the study. And I think that you are right into if you want to be a bit more honest, you divide and say, right, let's put to one side the guys who has good central PAs, move it out of the mm -hmm. way and concentrate in the other one just to do the exercise. And from the Australian, um, I just happened to be there when I was a fellow and, and there was, a, and when Ips just came, probably a year or two years before that, he just came to Melbourne. And there was uh, this, uh, which was before him actually, who, the one, a Norwegian guy who was wanted to study the bronchial arteries and he started to do all the angiograms, sorry, to do the map cast and compare with the University of Melbourne, compare the the tra trajectory of the bronchial arteries in a patient and the in any patient and the trajectory of the map cast. And they overimposed them and I saw that actually they they are the trajectory of the map cast is the same trajectory of the bronchial arteries or similar. Mm. It just dilates the bronchial arteries. So, so the paper before the Australian paper was a paper bomb by we were fellow, it's Norgard, the guy. And he that put uh, bronchial arteries are sorry, mapcas are bronchial arteries, dilated bronchial arteries. Mm. And that uh, carry on to the next stage and say, well, then we need to change our strategy. Our strategy should be just trying to dilate as much as we can any central PA. Even if they were one millimeter, we put a chant, etc. And it became mm -hmm. probably a few years of any meeting, international meeting, uh, talking about Matka was uh, the guy from Stanford and Ips uh, from Melbourne. Not necessarily um, Christian Brissard because he wasn't that convinced, but Ips, both of them were fighting and Bernie Rice, so they were completely opposite views of, of that. But it's very interesting because it shows you that the, the, the populations are different and then you can be a bit more critical about what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I think you have to recognise that even if you have good pulmonary arteries, that the um, uh, surgery on blood vessels doesn't do the blood vessels any favour. I mean, arches, any blood vessel, you get, you create a difference in post-surgical material, which is doesn't behave like normal blood vessel, it doesn't respond to pressure and flow in the same way as normal blood vessel is, de is designed to. You disrupted the relationship between the endothelium and the um, internal laminal structure. If you've got a lot of that, like you've got a lot of macro, um, it's um, uh, problematic. 
Anyway, but it's a good good piece of work, Bernie. It's always interesting yeah. to. Bernie, excellent review Bernie, actually. Awesome. One thing is certain we can take a message from this is that um, those who have chromosomal abnormalities don't do very well, as well as the ones who don't have chromosomal abnormalities in the long term, because that is certain, isn't it? Um, and the second um, is, Ram. Yeah. Ram, yeah. The other thing that we are wondering is that we do quite a lot of 22Q11 deletion, but we rarely, very rarely sort of um, look for um, allergies as well. Should we be more proactively looking for allergies for those who are negative for 22Q11? Uh, how do we do that? I, I'm not sure because uh, in, in our practice, we have seen only one or two and they did extremely bad, isn't it? You remember one of those? Actually, well, one of them recently, uh, Tommy Armitage. I'm not sure who did him. Uh, was it you, Rafael, from, from Manchester, the one who was so-called so spelling? Oh, yeah, recently, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, it was only after the surgery that I'm not sure what happened, but uh, an ultrasound abdomen was requested. And Musa thought that there was something abnormal with regards to the gallbladder and liver. And um, it was during Caroline's week that then she sent for um, genetics for um, allergies. So I don't have the results back yet, but if I, when I but get it back, I'll let you know. But I, I don't think he had MAP because he had tetralogy. He, no, he he's more of tetralogy, yeah. Huh? He did have abnormal coronary, but he, he was presented as a tetralogy. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, but I mean, the thing is that when we ask for microarray um, or for 22Q11 deletion for fish, a uh, fish for 22Q11 deletion, if it's negative, should we ask them, can you proceed on with, with allergies? With MAPCAS, I think we should. Yes. With, with MAPCAS, whenever you notice MAPCAS, we should ask for that. Because... But, but the ones without MAPCAS, even tetralis, tetralogy with allergies, they tend to be on the smaller side, don't they? We have a few that we have gone for palliative care. One of uh, um, ENPS patients who was raised money for things and whatnot, remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was talking about. The famous patient of Alizel syndrome and uh, who yeah. didn't make it, who died. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The allergies, they're pretty dysmorphic even when they're babies, aren't they? Yeah. So I guess if we're, even if we got a fish for 22Q that was negative and that's fine, we can proceed without irradiated blood, we would probably have another think if these were very dysmorphic infants with triangular faces and so on um, and ask for ask for microarray, I suppose. But, but is what, what do you think is allergy of a chromosome or abnormality? Yeah, is it it's a, a there's a jack one, there's a yeah, jack one, one mutation. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Jack one, J A G one. Yeah, but that's not, okay. Can I just repeat my question? It's a not a chromosomal abnormality. It's a genetic point mutation, isn't it? You won't yes. pick it up on microarray. You have to do specific testing. So yeah, so if you ask for if you ask for a full microarray and then you ask specifically look for twenty two Q eleven deletion plus Jack one. Yeah, well, yeah, we can do uh, set up a process. Getting I people mean, to I, do them twenty two Q is quite difficult. We we can ask we can ask the genetics lab to see you know how easy is it to add the Jack one to it or you know it's it's a whole different um, test altogether. I think the um, I think the geneticists would prefer you refer them to them but anyway, rather than doing. No, no, no. But what we could do is we could sort of say that okay, samples are safe, then we will refer to them um, later on. But we, I think we, refer, we do. I think the lab do save the samples. I know, but if we refer so many of the map curves or tetralogies to to the genetics, they will be overwhelmed. No, they won't. Okay. Just think how many breast cancer referrals they're getting. <laughs> but I guess the thing is, is that the importance of them having a chromosomal or genetic abnormality, call it what you will, is that it changes the outcomes of these children. And it's important for us to know that when we're counselling parents, when we're gearing them up for surgery and when we're deciding how we're going to manage them. And in reality, by the time you get more thorough genetic investigation back, you're probably going to be three, four months down the line, aren't you? Really, and, and committed to a to a management strategy. Yeah. Um, I'm also thinking of my antenatal ones. Should I add on if it's negative for 22 kg eleven deletion and you see palmy yeah. pieces with tiny, yeah. tiny, um, tiny PAs? Well, should you add an allergies to it? 
Well, I think you should ask the geneticist. I think it's a reasonable question, but it's their kind of area of expertise, isn't it? Whether they mm. feel that it's something you should screen for or whether you would be able to pick out the cases accurately enough after they're born or even in utero from the other qualities. I don't know. I mean, can we see gallbladders in utero? Uh, with difficulty. Um, Amber can diagnose it, but with difficulty. Yeah, well, fair enough. So that's a kind of question of sensitivity and specificity of your screening for screening kind of testing, isn't it? So we, can I just, I'm just, I'm just looking at this flow chart and I'm fascinated, but I can't, um, if I, can I, oh no, that won't work, will it? Uh, can I show you my screen? No, I can't do that. Um, I'm just looking at this simulated flow study. Okay, oops, sorry, Bernie, can you put yours back? I've just grabbed the screen, I think. The um, the simulated flow study. Now, everything I've ever um, known about catheters and pressures and whatever suggests you disrupt any useful pressure measurement as soon as you start doing anything. Can you really do a flow study on on bypass? Well, it, it 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 is one of the I think the only group that used to do that, or I don't know if they carry on doing that, was Stanford. And what they, what they uh, one, two things, they measure the Nakata index of the PAs. They do all the yeah. and all that thing. And for the decision making close or not close the VSD, they carry on on bypass and see how much flow goes through the PAs and measure the pressure. Growth, which was, to be honest, I, was, I, I never understood the, well, I more or less understood the physiology, how you, what you're looking for, but I never understood how, uh, that setting was going to be a reliable piece of information. Uh, and, and I think that for the reason, no main, well, no other group does it, as far as I know. Uh, be very interesting to know, to look at that particular test in it and look at how many patients had a negative test and came out and appeared to have good pressures and how many had a positive test and came out and had bad pressures, you know, given they've, they've done a surgical decision. And you could infer afterwards. Anyway, I think that the, the decision, in my view, the, the decision to close or not close the BSD, yes, 90% yes. of the decision should be pre op. So before the mm. operation, you more or less have a decision. And then, you know, you might have a small decision making at the time of the operation because you say, oh, actually, the PAs are much bigger than I thought, or less or smaller than I thought. But in your, in your planning, you should go, we should go with an idea about no way to close the BSD or absolutely let's close the BSD and in between say well should we just close and leave a fenestration which is yeah. uh, probably what we do normally ourselves yeah okay well that, that was really uh, brilliant thanks everybody for listening and for joining in um for adding the discussion yes hello Bernie, can I have the Melbourne paper as well, if if you have it available? Yeah, yeah, of course. I think um, did Oleg, Oleg, did you manage to email it out? Or? Yeah, yeah, I have emailed the article uh, to everyone, and it's in this um, team channel as well in files. You can find it. All right, okay, fine. Ooh, well okay. Done, right. Can you send this one as well? Okay, okay. If it is in the files, I'll we'll take that. In the files of this channel, yeah. Bernie, well, thank you very much. It was Thanks, a tremendous, tremendous job after your twenty-four hours on call. Thank you so much. I think it's a good good initiation and it's a good job done for all the team. It brings us together. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. So Bye. next week, next week we will have uh, ICU management for PA Mapcas, and Anand will present it uh, at the same time 9 a.m. So hope to see you. Thank you all. Who's in the hospital? Who's working? Thank you Adia. very much. Thank you. Um, it's uh, Caroline, uh, Salim, and Mike Bowles. Is it? Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye. Well done, Oleg, as well.